Take out your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 3. And uh, boy, what a great journey it has been already in the book of Romans. I love every moment of it. So rich. And uh, we're going to see that again tonight as we move into these passages. It's also good to come to the Lord's table. So I just love, you know, having a good meal together, getting in the word, a meal from that, and then just partaking together as a family. Love, love, love these nights. So hopefully you're there. Romans chapter 3, we're going to be picking up in verse 31 tonight. But let's begin with prayer. Lord, we're just so thankful that you are such a magnanimous God, so great, so awesome, so holy, so perfect, and yet you've placed your love on imperfect people. And though we have seen so much of our status that we're lost without you in the wretchedness of sin in the earlier chapters, uh, today we get to look about and into all that you do for us, that you deposit your righteousness towards us as sinners by faith and we're just amazed and I pray that as a result of looking at these truths tonight we fall more in love with you and we have such a greater gratitude and then to come to your table tonight and celebrate that oh it doesn't get any better so bless your word tonight as you always do we pray this in Jesus name we all say amen Amen. so again uh, we're here Romans chapter 3 verse 21 we'll begin here and again we've we've called the whole book of Romans foundations because there's so many foundational truths that are essential to understanding in our walk with the Lord Uh, but I'll tell you what as we come to this passage we're really one of the most glorious uh, sections in the Bible Uh, Job asked in chapter 9 and verse 2 can a man be righteous before God and Job asked that knowing the nature of man being a sinner and knowing the holiness of God his nature he he was wondering could that ever be possible to have this close relationship with God and this was kind of the dilemma of the disciples as well on one occasion in Matthew 19 25 they asked Jesus after seeing this situation unfold who then could be saved and Jesus looked at them and said with men this is impossible in other words, you're right, you, you, you can't be saved, you can't be changed, but though it's impossible with men, he went on to say, all things are possible with God. And so as we come to Romans 8, or 321, uh, this is a transition. We're now moving out of the darkness and inability of mankind to Christ's light and God's ability. Paul here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is moving us from the sinfulness of man to the righteousness of God that is available to us. And we'll see this all the way down through verse 31. Uh, Really, again, some of the most powerful verses in all of the Bible concerning God's plan to deal with man's sin, to make us righteous. So I've entitled our message tonight, How to Be Right Before God. How how is that possible? How to be right before God? And there are really eight truths that come out of this passage here. And I'll just kind of give them to up front. You won't remember them. I'll remind you. But the righteousness of God is available to us apart from works. It's appropriated by faith. It's activated by grace. It's accomplished by redemption. It's acquired at the cross, which we're looking at tonight at communion. It abolishes our boasting. It's available to everyone. And believe it or not, it it affirms the law. So all of those things are here. It's a lot of truth. So first of all, the righteousness of God is apart from works. And, And Paul begins in verse 21, but now. Now these two words are a breath of fresh air if you've been with us for the last you know, four or five weeks. Paul has been talking about sin for two and a half chapters. So he's been talking about, you know, the moral man guilty before God, the immoral man guilty, the religious man guilty, all men guilty. In this chapter alone, he said in verse 10, there's none righteous, no, not one. In verse 12, he said, there's none that does good, no, not one. In verse 16, he said, destruction and misery are part of man's way. So as we come to this verse, we have one of the greatest transitions in all the Bible. Against this backdrop of sin and judgment, he begins to talk about forgiveness and justification in Christ. So he says, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. Now, the first thing we learn here is that God's righteousness is available to us 
apart from the law, or really apart from the works of the law. In fact, he said in verse 20, preceding this verse, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. And so we've talked about this before, but the purpose of the law was never to make a man or a person righteous before God because no one can fulfill the law. The purpose of the law was to show us our inability to reach God's standard of righteousness. And so Paul here uh, tells us that God has provided the means for securing God's righteousness, which is really apart from the law, apart from the works, because the law, the works of the law, could never save anyone. No person is so good, no person is so righteous that God looks up at the angels in heaven or says to Gabriel, you know what, that guy, he's pretty good. He's not bad, let's, let's, have him. let's, let's bring him in. No, no one ever even comes close to the standard. And so he says the righteousness of God apart from law is revealed. Now, where's that revealed? Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So we understand that God established that in the Old Testament, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, a truth would be verified. If someone was accused of breaking the law, you had to at least have two witnesses to prove that or be thrown out of court. Or if you had someone being commended even, you had to have at least two witnesses. And God essentially gives us two witnesses, though they're part of one thing. Uh, it, he really says it's a part though from uh, works, but we have actually the law and the prophets. The law, when we talk about the law, first of all, the law, we would say really refers to the Torah, the first five books of Moses, right? And it contains not just the 10 commandments, but 613 commandments, right? And then the prophets refer to all the remainder of the scripture. So really, when we're talking about the Old Testament, we're really talking about the law and the prophets, the totality. And Paul is saying here that righteousness, apart from the law, apart from the works of the law, is not a new concept. This was God's design. Now, yes, God did require saints, believers, to uh, perform certain sacrifices, celebrate feasts. However, none of those things were ever a means to acquiring righteous, uh, a righteous standing before God. God was always concerned about the person's heart, right? right? Rend your heart, not your garment. Circumcise your heart, not your flesh. God was concerned about the heart, about faith. In fact, Paul will go on to talk about faith in this chapter. And then in the next chapter, he talks about Abraham's faith quite a bit. So a right standing before God was always apart from works, though it was taught, that was taught in the Old Testament. Did you realize that the sacrifices themselves were a picture, a picture of that very truth? They could never take away sin. They could only cover it, cover it for a time, which speaks of man's inability to be saved by the works of the law. At the same time, they, though, understand this, they also provided a way. They were pointing to the way that when the Messiah comes, he would literally take away the sins of the world. But all of the sacrifices, all of the duties of the priests, all the prescribed ceremonies were symbols. The totality of the, the law and the prophets were actually saying that. In fact, let's look at this. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 24. I love this passage because it really illustrates this, that it, the Old Testament was all about Jesus. In Luke chapter 24, we have two guys that have left Jerusalem early on Sunday morning, the same Sunday morning that Jesus rose from the dead. And they were discouraged. They, they thought that their hope had been misplaced. They had seen Jesus crucified and buried. And so discouraged and disappointed, they left town before dawn. Now we'll pick up in verse 15. But while they converse and reason, keep in mind, they're leaving Jerusalem Sunday. Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained, so they didn't know it was him. And of course, that, that, that could be the case because they see Jesus, you know, just bloodied, crucified, and buried. They're not thinking, this is Jesus. He doesn't even look the same, you know. And, and he says to them, Jesus says, hey, what kind of conversation is this that you're having with one another as you walk? And you're so sad. Then one of the names was Cleopas. He answered and said, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem and you've not known these things which happen here in these days? Where you been? Jesus said, oh, do tell. <laughs> what things? 
They said, well, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth. I love they tell Jesus about Jesus. It's just kind of cool. Who was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people. And how the chief priests, the rulers, delivered him to be condemned to death. And they crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Hello, he told the disciples, the third day I'll rise, went over their heads. But beyond that, yeah, certain women from our company arrived at the tomb early, astonished us. They didn't find his body, and they came saying that they'd also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And on top of that, some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't find a body, you know. The hymn they didn't see. So they kind of thought maybe grave robbers. Either way, they're out of town. And Jesus says, foolish ones, slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. And this is what I want you to see. And beginning at Moses and the prophets, the law and the prophets, the totality of scripture, he expounded to them in the scriptures the things concerning what? Himself. You see, the Old Testament scriptures were all about Jesus. Now, it was apart from those works. You couldn't save yourself, but it was pointing to Jesus. By the way, this is one sermon I would have loved to hear, wouldn't you? Have Jesus expounding the old scriptures in reference to himself. Yeah, you remember that mercy seat? Yeah, that was me. You know, the blood on the dope posts and the lintel, yeah, that was me. Yeah, you know, the, the cloud that led the people, that was me. Yeah, the water that came around, yeah, that was me. All of that, amazing. So all of the law and the prophets were a witness pointing to Jesus. By the way, I love the response of these men down in verse 32. They said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? I, it was just actually yesterday, I get heartburn every once in a while. I had a bad case of it, you know. But have you ever had a good case of heartburn? That's a good one, right? When was the last case, time you had a good case of heartburn because Jesus was opening the scriptures to you? I hope it's daily. Uh, Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 15, 16, your word was found and it was to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. All right, now you go back to Romans 3, 21. And what Paul is simply saying here is the Old Testament scriptures do point to the fact that there is a righteousness. It's always said there is a righteousness available, but it's apart from the law. It's apart from the works law. It was always pointing to the Savior. So how is it appropriated? Number two, by faith, by faith. He says, even the righteousness of God, though through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. So it's not appropriated by works or our behavior. It's appropriated by believing. For by grace we're saved through faith, right? Ephesians 2.8. Or therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Romans 5.1. And so Paul tells us that the righteousness of God, this right standing before God is appropriated through faith in Jesus Christ on all who believe. Now, let's talk about that for a moment. Because is this verse saying then saying, well, all I have to do is believe. Yeah, I believe Jesus and I'm saved. Well, yes and no, not quite. Because we know that saving faith certainly encompasses more than just a verbal declaration that Jesus is who he says he was. And the Bible says that he did. Faith is much more than just an affirmation of truth or acknowledgments of who he is. Because the Bible tells us in James 2, 19, that the demons believe. They have a great theology. And there's even a fear, a holy fear. They tremble, but they're not saved. So genuine faith is not only exercises, I should say, its intellect. But very important, it exercises its will to the lordship of Jesus Christ. So I, I think of it this way. Let's say that, you know, let's say you're taking a trip to the desert Maybe Death Valley. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but let's say you do. And through a series of events, you get lost. And now it's been days. You haven't had a drink of water for at least three days. And now you're beginning to die of thirst. But as you continue to press on, you come across a spring of water. There it is. Fantastic. Fresh water. Now you can look at that water and say, that is water. <laughs> that will save my life. I know that and I believe that. But if you don't drink of it, you're going to die, right? So knowing the truth about Jesus is not enough. I must act upon what I believe. There's going to be 
attendant faith works, right? Or think about this. If I truly believe in Christ, you're going to see the fruit of that in my life. You're going to see actions that back that up. Now, this is a crazy illustration, but what if I said there's a bomb in this room and it's going off in five minutes? But I say that and I just continue, though, to talk to you or to you. And I just keep talking and talking past five minutes, 10 minutes. You come to the conclusion, I really don't believe what I told you. There's no substance to my profession that I made. And so when a person places their faith in Jesus Christ, listen, there's substance. It will affect their whole life. It'll affect how they move, how they talk, everything. In fact, Paul says later in Romans 6, 17, God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart. So faith and obedience always go hand in hand. If someone is saved, they're gonna see obedience. You're gonna see a heart change. So genuine faith always bears the fruit of obedience and, of course, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, and so forth. Now, notice also this last phrase here. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ is imputed to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. That word literally means distinction. And that's a liberating concept. Because under the old covenant... If you were a Gentile and you wanted to approach God, well, that was pretty hard. Well, I heard about God. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to go to the temple. Well, I want to see and experience that. Well, you can only go so far. You can only go to the outer court, get some rumblings, you know. But maybe you're Jewish. You're a Jewish woman. Yeah, but you can only go as far as the court of the women. You're a Jewish male. You can only go as far as right up to the gate of the the priests where the priests perform their their, duties. But even the priests themselves can't even go into the temple of God, into the holy place where God's presence is. That's just for one man once a year, the high priest. But when Jesus died on the cross, and again, we celebrate this tonight as we come to the Lord's table. Jesus tore the veil that separated the holy place from the holiest of holies, from top to bottom, from God to man, so that all of us now can approach God by faith on the same basis for the sacrifice of our sins. So now there's no distinction Salvation, as he says, is available to all and on all who believe. Now he transitions though and kind of, but reminds us, verse 23, because all have sinned, because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So again, we're reminded that every single person, no matter how good they are outwardly, appear outwardly. I mean, maybe they've established an orphanage, all of orphanages all around the world. Perhaps they've donated millions of dollars to feed the poor. But no matter how good a person is, no matter how kind, no matter how philanthropic they are, all men come short of the glory or of the righteous standard of God, which is perfection. So I've pictured it this way many times, but I think it's helpful. Let's say we get a large group of people from all areas of life, young, old, super fit, some, you know, not so healthy, some incredible athletes as well as some average Joes. And we go all the way to the Gulf of Mexico and we're out there in the Gulf of Mexico. And I said, here's what we got to do. We all have to jump to the island of Galveston. Causeway's out. No, the goal is to jump to Galveston and you can't touch the water. So a few people take their best shot. You know, someone go, I jump, get five feet. Someone goes 10 feet, and I, that's pretty good for your old at 10 feet. That's pretty amazing, yeah. Now you have some super athletes. I mean, they're in tip-top shape, and they run like crazy, go 20 feet. And then one person even goes 25 feet. Fantastic. Well, guess what? Though some le- leapt or went further than others, no one even comes close to the island. And it's the same way in attaining God's standard of righteousness. We don't even come close close no matter how good we might think we are some are better than not even close as paul says in verse 10 there is none righteous no not one but again the good news and this is paul's point just as everyone apart from christ stands equally guilty before god because of their sin so everyone who is in christ jesus by faith stands equally righteous before god that is great news So all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. However, the righteousness, as we saw, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus is available to all and on all all who believe. 
So this righteousness of God, it's apart from works, though the law and the prophets spoke of it. It's appropriated by faith. But thirdly, it's activated by grace. Verse 24, being justified freely by his grace. Now, the first word that jumps out, of course, is this word justify. Uh, the word in the original language is a, a legal term. It means to be deemed right or righteous. In fact, it comes from the same root word that we sometimes in the Bible translate righteous or righteousness. But what is justification? Well, I, I like to think of it this way. God sees us as righteous, but in justification, making us righteous, he sees us justified, never sinned. And I love that. So when a person gives their life to Christ, God judicially declares them to be righteous and looks at them, looks at us, which is mind boggling, like I never sinned. And this is very important. This is an act. It's a judicial act. This is not a process. There's no degrees in justification. I got saved. I've been justified. But how are you doing? Well, I, I'm, I'm working it up. I've got most of my sins forgiven, but I'm waiting for the last ones. They're pretty big. It's going to take a while. No. When a person gives their life to Christ, his righteousness, God's righteousness, is instantly, instantaneously imputed on my account. God says, I love you, Ron. I've, I've made you holy. I'm like, what? So that's justification. Now, sanctification is a little different. Sanctification is a process. Sanctification is really where, whereby God is helping us to live out who we already are in Christ. I've been made righteous, but I still sin. So God is helping me in this process of sanctification to become more like and more holy. But justification is a legal matter. God puts his righteousness on my record and, he, and in place of my sinfulness. And, and no one can know that. It, it's a finished work. In fact, listen, it's his work. It's not even mine. That's important. Notice it says being justified freely by his grace. So this is not man's work. And I find that again to be very encouraging because if for somehow at one moment, which is impossible, but let's just say you could somehow get to a moment of righteousness, you could never sustain that. You would drop it right away. You would inevitably fall. However, because God is the one who justifies, his work can never be thwarted. It can never be annulled. It's really what Paul talks about in Philippians 1, 6. He who began the good work in will complete it. So justification, this once and for all act accomplished solely by God. Now notice here, it says we've been freely or justified freely by his grace. And you know that word grace, we've talked about many times, the, the Greek word is charis, and it means gift. Sometimes translated grace, sometimes translated gift. By definition, a gift is something freely given, something freely received. It's unmerited, it's un, really unearned, you don't earn a gift. And so the righteousness of God is freely given by grace. Grace, you could say, is the catalyst. Why? So that man, no man can take credit for it. I can't take any credit for what God does for me. Mind-blowing. In fact, he actually uses the word freely here. Freely given. That word means without a cause. You and I have been justified, saved, redeemed without a cause. There was no cause that would merit God to look down from heaven and say, those people are so awesome. They are so great. Man, look what they've done to the world. They've just, man, they're so beautiful, so loving on people, care for one another. No. God, out of his love, has chosen to pour his grace on mankind. And those who respond by faith, he declares them righteous. What a, what a great, overwhelming truth. I love it. Now, let's move to a fourth thought, though. Um, you might be thinking, now, hold on a second. How could God, perfectly holy, justify anyone that is completely sinful? How is that possible? Uh, well, Paul answers that at the end of verse 24. Uh, the, the righteousness of God is available to the believer because it's accomplished by redemption. He's been redeemed. Through the redemption, he says, that is in Christ Jesus. That, that word redemption, apolutrosis, it means to be delivered by paying a price. 
In ancient times, it was used to speak of a person who pays the ransom price for a criminal or a slave or a captor, and they're set free. The most common term, though, would be someone set free of slavery because in the Roman Empire, there were six million slaves. And so you could go to the slave market, maybe a family or a friend or a member, and have enough money to purchase them and buy them out of that condition. Moses used this very term, speaking of the fact when God brought the children of Israel out of their Egyptian bondage. In Exodus 15, 13, he said, God, you and your mercy had left forth the people whom you have redeemed. And this is what Paul is saying here. Just as God redeemed his people from the physical slavery in Egypt, so Christ has redeemed us from the spiritual slavery of our sin. And how did he do that? Well, what was the redemption price? First Peter 1 18 right and 19 knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold so he just wants to make sure it's not like going to the slave market and paying a price if you could pay this price with the silver and gold you get them out no 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 that wasn't the cost the cost was the precious blood of Christ Jesus a lamb without blemish and without spot so the only way that we could be redeemed was through the perfect righteousness of Jesus himself. The purchase price was his death on the cross. Again, what a perfect passage to be in as we come to the Lord's table tonight. Because we don't deserve it. We don't merit it. Jesus redeemed us simply because he loves us. His love did that. We have a graphic illustration of this in the book of Hosea. We studied Hosea, I think, a couple years ago in our midweek study. But God told the prophet Hosea, I want you to marry this woman. Her name is Gomer. Not a great name, right? (laughs) Neither was her life. Gomer was a prostitute. So God tells his prophet, I want you to marry a prostitute. And he did, and he had children by her. And she continued to leave all the time and go back to her harlotry. Again and again, and he'd take her back. Finally, when she was past her prime and she was totally broke, totally destitute, she was for sale on the auction block as a slave. And God once again tells Hosea, you go and you redeem your wife. Now, why would God have a holy prophet of God go through such hardship and such humiliation and buy his prostitute wife out of slavery when she's done it again and again and again. Why? To demonstrate God's love for us. Because God's people were habitually going after other gods, playing spiritual harlotry, and God did not refuse them. He still loved them. And now you think about what Jesus has done for the totality of the world in going to the cross. Why? Because he loves mankind. And he loves us so much, he paid the overwhelming price of his own life, his own blood to purchase us that we could have fellowship with him. That just, I just, it it blows my mind every time I think of that. A story is told of a young boy who lived in a New England seaport and he loved to watch the sailboats come in and out of the port, the harbor. And uh, one day he decided to build his own little toy sailboat of his own. He worked in it for weeks, you know, to make sure he had all the details right. And finally, the big day came for its maiden voyage. So he excitedly and triumphantly placed that little boat in the water, you know, right there in the harbor. Suddenly, a burst of wind came, filled its sails, and swept it out of sight. He couldn't find it. He, He was heartbroken. In fact, every day for a month, he would go up and down the shore, you know, seeing if he could find it. One day... As he was walking through town, he noticed his boat in the picture, or the window, I should say, of a store. So he runs in the store, begins to tell the owner, hey, that that window in the boat, I mean, that boat in the window there, that's mine. I I made it, it's mine, you know. The owner kept telling him, or listening to him, sure, sure it is. Yeah, no, I made it, it's mine. Well, after listening to all his pleas, the owner simply said, look, if you want to purchase the boat, it's going to cost you 20 bucks. And uh, imagine paying for the own, your old boat that you made, right? But out of love for his workmanship, the little boy pulled out 20 bucks and he paid the owner. As he left the store, he looked at that little boat and he said, little boat, 
You are twice mine. You are mine because I made you, and you are mine because I bought you. That's exactly how Jesus loves us. He loves us because he made us, he created us, and he loves us because he purchased us, he bought us. And where did he buy us? Number five, our righteousness is acquired at the cross. Paul begins in verse 25, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. Now here's another interesting word, right? Propitiation. Uh, It can be translated actually uh, mercy seat. You know, you know what the mercy seat was in the Old Testament, right? It was the lid that essentially covered the Ark of the Covenant. And of course, it stood on the Ark and it was overlaid with gold and had the two cherubim or angels on either side. See, God had given his people the law. But like all men, all of them broke the law. We've talked about that. In fact, every single time you would read the law, you would be reminded of how far you were from God if you were honest with yourself. As a result, this is what God did. God said, what I want you to do is I want you to put the written law inside of the Ark of the Covenant. And then you put the lid on and it'll be in the holies of holies. Then once a year, the high priest is going to come in there. And he's going to take some of the blood that was from the sacrificial lamb. And he's going to sprinkle it on top of the mercy seat. So that when God looks down from heaven, he's going to see that blood covering the law it's covered for a time and God would extend mercy to man for a time it was covered and so we read here in regard to Christ verse 25 whom God set forth as propitiation by his blood through faith notice to demonstrate his righteousness because of in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed So in gracious forbearance, God under the old covenant would pass over the sins previously committed. They they would be covered for a time. To demonstrate at the present time, though, his righteousness. Again, as we talked about, all of these symbolic acts in the Old Testament where the priest would, you know, cover the blood of the lamb on the day of atonement. It was a symbol. But here's the thing. It couldn't take away sin. It covered it. That's where we get the word Yom Kippur. Kippur means to cover. But in doing this, though, it did prefigure the time when the Messiah would come, Jesus, who would then come and offer up his own perfect blood, and he would be the Lamb of God who takes away, doesn't cover, but takes away the sins of the world. In fact, this word propitiation, though you can look at it as the mercy seat, it's more properly translated to satisfy. And this is what Jesus did at the cross. He satisfied the righteous requirement for sin by offering up his blood, his life at the cross. So again, verse 26, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now that's an interesting concept as well, because how can God be just dealing with sin, yet at the same time, be a justifier, a one who does sin. Kind of interesting. But that's what happens at the cross. In his justice, a sacrifice, a perfect sacrifice must be offered. It is his. So he is the just one who does that. But in doing so, he's able then to justify and make right standing before God those who come to him by faith. So he alone, only Christ alone could be both the just and the justifier of the one who comes or has faith in him. Again, the beauty of the cross. Only there could that happen. And so the righteousness of God is apart from the works. It's appropriated by faith. It's get activated by grace, accomplished through redemption, and it's acquired at the cross. But there's a sixth truth here. As a result of all these things, That abolishes boasting. He says in verse 20, where is boasting then? (laughs) The answer is, it's excluded. How is it excluded? By what law? Of works? No, by the law of faith. Now that's an interesting term, the law of faith. In other words, if, if you want to follow a law, follow this law. The law of faith in Jesus Christ. Kind of an interesting term he uses, but he does it similarly to a group of people in John chapter 6. 
In John chapter six, these people come up to Jesus in John 6, 28, and they say to Jesus, what must we do? They may we do the works of God. So they wanted to do something. They were drilled on doing works, you know. Jesus answered and said to them, hey, this is the work of God that you believe. You want to work? Work faith. Do that. Uh, now, Jesus wasn't saying in that passage, we're saved by our works, and neither is this passage here in Romans. Paul is using a figure of speech. The only law you need to be concerned about is the law of faith. And he clarifies that by saying in verse 28, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. So again, there's nothing we can earn, merit, or gain to be saved. We can only receive it by faith. By the way, it's this very truth here. You know, the fact that, uh, you know, we can't boast because it's all of God is what inspired the hymn writer Isaac Watts to pen these words. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and I pour contempt on all of my pride. See, if salvation were through the law or through works, then I could have something to boast about. But because I can't save myself, listen, the best I can do is what Paul says in Galatians 4.16. He says, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of Jesus Christ. That's something to boast about. Oh, thank you, Jesus, right? I like what Warren Wiersbe had said about this. This is so good. He says, when a swimmer is saved from drowning, he doesn't brag because he trusted in the lifeguard. What else could he do? And when a believer, a believing sinner is justified by faith, he can't even boast in his faith. He can merely boast in the wonder of a savior. I love that. So the righteousness of God by faith abolishes pride. Moving on, Paul emphasizes the fact that Christ's righteousness is available to everyone. He says, Are, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. And again, we've seen this before, revolutionary truth to the Jews, as well as Gentiles. Because the Jews were so prejudiced against anyone who wasn't a Jew. In fact, instead of uh, considering themselves belonging to God, the Jews saw God belonging to them. He, he's ours, you know, no one else's. In spite of God's command to be a light to the world, to the Gentiles, they didn't do it. And of course, the classic example of this is Jonah. God tells Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. Well, that's the capital of the Gentile country of Assyria. I want you to go there. And I want you to share them about me, who I am. And Jonah refuses. Oh, I'm not going there. I'm going there. I'm not going there. Why? Was he afraid? I mean, these, they might kill me. They were treacherous, treacherous people. No, he, Jonah was not afraid of, of failure. Jonah was afraid of success. He was afraid that he goes there and these people might just change and God just might love on them. So guess what happens? Of course, you know, the story takes off, goes the wrong way. God swallows him by fish, vomits it up. And so, okay, I'll go. And, and then he reluctantly shares the Lord and revival takes place. People get saved. I mean, it's a national revival. The biggest one we have recorded anywhere. And we read in Jonah 4 too, this is Jonah's response. Ah, Lord, was this not what I said when I was in my country? Therefore, I left to Tarshish, for I know that you're a gracious and merciful God. You're slow to anger. You're abundant in loving kindness. One who relents from doing harm. God, I knew that's what you were going to do. I knew it. Can you believe that? So that just illustrates how the Jews saw themselves in regard to Gentiles. They wanted nothing to do with them. But I love what God says here. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since there's one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Those two terms are just used to describe the Jew and the Gentile. And it's so good to remind ourselves, listen, at the foot of the cross, there is no race, there is no nationality, there is no class, there is no sex, there is no age, none of that stuff. We all come equally the same, sinners in need of a Savior, Amen. period, right? Amen. And then here's the great thing. We all come with this muddled thing, and then we leave our knees at the cross, and we're all family. Amen. Then we're all brothers and sisters. That's awesome. 
So God is not the God of the Jew or the God of the Arab or the God of the African or the God of the Puerto Rican. He's God of everyone. All of us. He loves everyone. Praise the Lord. So when someone places their faith in Jesus Christ, they become part of the body of Christ. So great. Now, finally, you have one more thing here. The righteousness of God in Christ affirms the law. Interesting enough. Verse 31. He says, now, do we make void the law, though, through faith? I mean, we come by faith, we're, recon we're reconciled, we're redeemed, justified by Jesus. Do we need the law? <clears throat> Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Back in verse 21, Paul said that the righteousness of God, we started this way, is apart from the law. But here he says we establish the law. What is he saying? Just this, the righteousness of God in Christ by faith establishes the law in two ways. One, it affirms the fact that the law fulfilled its purpose in showing us our sinfulness so that it drives us to God. That's a great thing. And two, it establishes the law by fulfilling the penalty for sin, which is death. But here's the great thing. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. Now, yes, he came to live a perfect life. He did that. But how did he come to fulfill it? He came to live the law and offer up the perfect sacrifice, thereby fulfilling the law, so that we can now be saved by faith. So we don't toss out the law. The law reminds us of our sinful state before God and reminds us that Jesus offered his life for us, that I can now be saved. Praise the Lord. So as we come to this point in Romans, we've moved from the blackness, the darkness of man's sin, of which we all possess, to the beauty of God's righteousness. That salvation is available to us apart from the works of the law. It's appropriated by simple faith coming to him. It's activated by his free grace. It's accomplished by his redemption, the purchase price being his blood. It's acquired at the cross. And because of this wonderful gift, it abolishes boasting. It's available to everyone. And every time we read the law, we're reminded of how good it is that he did it for us. Amen. Amen. Man, that's a great cause. Let's pray. 